¿Listo? ¿Sí? Genial. Eh, te hablo, sí. Además nos falta Roberto, que tiene que reconectarse. Imagino que está oyéndonos. Sigo hablando, seguimos conectando. Lo tienes, ¿no? Vale. Roberto... Roberta, quizás puedes mandarle un mensaje a Roberto. Vale. Ah. Ya está, ya está. Information we're having small technical problems with the connection with Shanghai. Yeah, I know. I think he was having internet problems earlier. Okay. Ok, perfecto. Bien. Hello. Empiezo en castellano dando la bienvenida a todo el mundo eh, y voy a continuar en inglés con las dos personas que tenemos aquí en conexión. 
uh, we have um, Terry and Roberto, and uh, Roberto will lead uh, the introduction, and then Terry will follow up with uh, a description. Hola, 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 hola. And hola. body of knowledge. We are changing the microphone. And I hope that's all. So I, I leave the word with uh, Roberto, and we will go into deep conversation later on. Welcome, everybody. Gracias, muchas gracias. Solo quiero probar si me escuchan bien. Luca, fantástico. Eh, gracias, es un placer para mí estar aquí. Eh, muchas gracias por la invitación. Primero que nada, una disculpa por no estar en persona. Eh, ahora estoy conectado desde Beijing, en China, atendiendo la conferencia Cumulus que tenía que estar por acá, pero con mucho agradecimiento por el décimo encuentro. Gracias a Roberta Barbán, a Darío Asante eh, del Comité Académico y desde luego pues, a Cristian Cullen y a Gloria Escribano. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to shift to, to, to English because I have two friends and designers that I really admire uh, with me. So it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Terry Irwin. Uh, she's a professor and the former dean of the School of Design and uh, today's director of the Transition Design Institute in Carnegie Mellon uh, University. Please help, help me giving her a warm welcome. <laughs> and uh, I have also with me Lucas Muñoz. Uh, uh, his work, he, he works in the field of art and design. Uh, his work explores the redefinition, of, the redefinition of today's object spaces and engineering functionality. Se cortó, Roberto. Hemos tenido un pequeño break. Uh -huh. Terry is online, yeah. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Well, there's clearly an issue with Roberto. I believe Roberto was going to introduce both of us and give word to Terry. So I believe we can go directly into her presentation and then let's hope that the connection uh, is satisfying for after that presentation and our conversation. Terry, please, uh, if you don't mind. Okay, yeah. thank you so much. I'm really pleased to be with all of you today, and I'm so sorry that I cannot give my presentation in Spanish. I can understand more than I speak, but believe me, you want me to speak English. Um, so let me see if this is working. Can you see my screen? Are birds flying? Yes. Excellent. Okay. So in the next half hour or so, I'm going to talk to you about transition design, an approach for addressing the many complex wicked problems confronting 21st century societies and the need for us to intentionally transition our communities, organizations, and really entire societies toward better long-term futures. So transition design brings together two global means. First, the idea that entire societies must transition toward more sustainable, equitable, and desirable long-term futures. And the second is the realization that these transitions will require intentional systems level change. Now, you can see evidence of these means in the number of transition-related projects and initiatives that are springing up around the world and the recent rise in what I'll call deep systems thinking and the proliferation of knowledge, tools, and processes for understanding complex systems and systems problems. So 21st century societies are facing countless complex problems, things like social and political polarization, climate change, war, forced migration, erosion of human rights, especially women's rights, the increasing gap between the rich and poor, and the emergence of a small, uber-wealthy, highly influential group, mostly dominated by white men who live over here. The designers refer to these problems as wicked problems, 
Now, the list is very long, and these problems are so ubiquitous that we tend to think of them as global and therefore a step or two removed from our everyday lives. But here's the thing. Wicked problems always manifest in place and culture-specific ways. Because of these characteristics, these problems straddle organizational boundaries and are multi-causal and multi-scalar. They're comprised of multiple stakeholder groups who have conflicting agendas and uneven power relations. Every solution we implement ramifies through the entire system in ways that are entirely unpredictable. That's why so many solutions fail. Every problem is unique and constantly changing. Every solution we implement changes the entire system. And perhaps the most important characteristic Wicked problems are always connected to other wicked problems in complex ways at multiple levels of scale. Now, learning to see and map these interconnections and interdependencies is at the heart of systems thinking, and we believe is the key to resolving these kinds of problems. Often, these problems remain invisible to us because we're too focused on the smaller problems right at the end of our nose. Here's what happens. We view problems within a narrow but manageable context of our own departments, organizations, industry sectors, fields, or disciplines. Areas like national or local government, policy, the nonprofit sector, NGOs, funding and philanthropy, all kinds of industry, and many more. We identify a problem within our own organization or sector, and usually it's urgent. We're all doing triage all the time and we set about finding a solution for it. And we secretly hope to find that single silver bullet solution for that single problem. This hope runs deep in all of us, that if I just look hard enough, I'll find the right solution. But we often harbor other hopes as well. We often secretly hope it can be solved with either money and or technology, because these are clear, quick, doable fixes. And this is going on in different sectors all the time. The only real difference is that each sector or discipline has its own unique problem-solving methodologies, processes, and tools. And these approaches work really well as long as we stay within our own field of expertise. But trying to collaborate across disciplinary divides or perhaps even across departments in a large organization can be challenging to say the least. It's a little like the parable of the blindfolded scientists and the elephant. The problem looks like a different animal depending on your perspective. So achieving that important shared problem definition, which is crucial to solving a problem, becomes impossible. But here's the catch. Single silver bullet solutions only work on simple problems. When it comes to wicked problems, they're rubbish. Here's basically what happens. We think we're addressing a single problem when we're actually dealing with a problem cluster, multiple interdependent problems whose interconnections remain invisible to us. So we just keep aiming single solutions at what we think are single problems, but in reality are pieces of a problem cluster. And we can keep doing this for weeks or months or even years. And we might put dents in the problem, but despite all the resources and energy we keep investing, many problems resist resolution because we don't see that these seemingly unrelated problems are connected to each other in complex ways within and across sectors. But wait, it gets worse. These problems are also connected up and down systems levels. So to understand these problems, we have to look upstream, or more precisely, we have to look up systems levels. Because this is what we're often dealing with, a complex web of interconnections and interdependencies across sectors and up and down systems levels. This web of interconnections that involves both social and material interactions is what keeps these problems stuck and extends their consequences into the social and environmental spheres. This is why we call them wicked. 
And here's how we think about the tools and approaches needed at the different levels. So at the lower levels, we're finding and resolving familiar problems in our own sector or industry using familiar tools and methodologies. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. If we trace the problems that are resisting resolution upstream to higher systems levels, we're getting into territory in which collaboration across disciplinary divides has to happen, even though it's difficult. And it requires tools and innovative cross-disciplinary approaches. These are new, but they do exist. But at the level of a wicked problem, we're in new territory. There are very few existing tools and approaches for addressing these problems, and yet, if we solve for a wicked problem upstream, the positive results quickly trickle downstream and solve for multiple seemingly unrelated problems simultaneously. This is really the premise for transition design. Now, I've diagrammed this in a very simplistic way. In fact, I've drawn them like we think of them, little separate boxes with their own separate issues. This type of compartmentalized thinking is actually part of the problem because this is actually more what it looks like. Multiple sectors, industries, and fields of all sizes represented by the white bubbles with countless interconnected, interdependent problems overlapping them in the blue and the orange bubbles. And it's this invisible and unexamined web of interconnections and interdependencies across those sectors and up and down systems levels that keeps these problems stuck. And to complicate things even more, these problems are heating up and cooling off all the time. It's a little like twinkle lights. And the trick is learning to read the complex system dynamics to see which problem clusters are lighting up at any given moment. So you get the idea. So in order to address these systems problems, we first need a better understanding of systems themselves, how they behave and how they transition over time. Essentially, we all need to become students of systems and systems are perhaps best explained by this old joke. Two fish bump into each other and one says, how's the water? And the other says, what water? Marsha McLuhan, in his book, War and Peace in the, Global Village, in the Global Village, said, one thing fish know nothing about is water, since they have no anti-environment which would enable them to perceive the element they live in. Systems are so ubiquitous and our interactions with them are so pervasive, we really don't see them and therefore we don't understand them very well. Our work at the Transition Design Institute is concerned with how we learned to see systems and understand how they behave. So we live in a world of systems nested within systems nested within systems. There are transportation systems, infrastructural systems, financial, economic, and communication systems. And all of these are permeated by cultural and disciplinary norms, laws and informal practices, or general ways of doing things. And together, all of these form what are known as socio-technical systems, which are in turn situated within the natural world. And here's the thing, these systems are always in transition because human societies are always in transition. But these transitions, oh, my slides have stopped. These transitions are unpredictable and full of drift. And the long-term futures that we're currently transitioning toward aren't necessarily the futures we want. But transition design argues that we can intentionally change the transition trajectories toward futures we do want. Now, I know it sounds like a monumental undertaking, but recent history taught us something about transition trajectories. Remember that all of these countries started out at more or less the same place. And we learned that because of systems dynamics, small changes in the present can make a big difference in where you end up in the future. We think that addressing wicked problems is a strategy 
for intentionally shifting the transition trajectories of our organizations, cities, and entire societies toward better long-term futures. But in order to design for sustainable societal transitions, we need to change the way we think about problems and solutions because that in itself is a wicked problem. We take a single solution to a single problem approach that involves small groups of disciplinary experts solving problems as quickly and as profitably as possible for relatively small elite audiences. We're looking for silver bullet solutions that hit very small targets. But wicked problems are moving targets, or perhaps big tangled mess is a better analogy. So a single silver bullet solution won't put a dent in a wicked problem. In fact, it will probably make it worse because every wicked problem is connected to other wicked problems. So traditionally conceived solutions will address only a piece of something much bigger. Let me show you what I mean. We find a problem and we set about solving it the same way we've solved other similar problems dozens of times before. As I said, sometimes it works, but often it doesn't. And it's because we frame the problem in too small of a context. So we end up developing solutions that address symptoms of a much bigger problem. If we ask, for instance, why childhood asthma in certain areas is on the rise, we have to expand the problem frame. But doing this reveals a new, unexpected, and more complex problem. And if we keep moving up systems levels, we inevitably will arrive at a genuine wicked problem that has manifested in place and culture specific ways and find that it's connected to a host of other wicked problems that will be unique to that particular place and culture. So when we compare our original solution to the root wicked problem, we see that at best the solution is a band-aid and at worst will prolong the problem resolution or it might actually make the problem worse. And of course, looming over most wicked problems um, are large societal structures like capitalism, which prioritizes growth and profit over the concerns of people and planet. This is what happens when we frame single problems in small contexts and create single solutions within disciplinary silos. <clears throat> so my point is this, we need to think in terms of system solutions and acupuncture is a helpful metaphor. If needles are the solutions, we know intuitively that it will take multiple needles situated in strategic and often counterintuitive places in the system repeatedly over long periods of time to transition that system back into health and balance. And of course, I'm calling the body a system. This is the mindset and practice that we think we need to adopt when addressing wicked problems. And here is the good news. Although our socio-technical systems are riddled with wicked problems that are directing our transitions toward unsustainable futures, these problems are rhizomatic and interdependent. And because of this interdependence, if we address any single wicked problem, <clears throat> we will automatically address others. But to leverage these systems dynamics, we need to frame wicked problems within much larger contexts than we normally would and banish the thought of single solutions to single problems. Now, in the past few years, we've been working on an approach for framing wicked problems within radically large systems contexts that include the past, the present, and the future. And we do this by working with the stakeholders who are connected to and affected by a particular wicked problem. So we leverage the wisdom already within the system by gathering stakeholders' knowledge about their problem, about the problem and their hopes for its resolution. Their responses are aggregated into a series of systems maps that together create 
a high level systemic understanding of the problem. It functions a bit like the acupuncture map and it helps us do two important things. First, it identifies leverage points in the system, places where solutions have the greatest potential to solve for multiple issues simultaneously. And second, to guide the solutioning process during a years long transition toward problem resolution. Now I'm gonna show you some tangible examples from a recent project as I walk you through just a few steps in the transition design approach. So for the past few ye two years, we've worked with the NASDAQ Center and eight other research partners to address the wicked problem of a lack of funding for minority entrepreneurs in the US and UK. You can read more about the project on the NASDAQ Center website and watch six videos which go into more depth on each of these steps. The work involves bringing together as many stakeholder groups as possible who are, as I said before, connected to and affected by the wicked problem. In step one, each group maps the myriad interconnected issues that make the problem wicked and keep it stuck, but from their own point of view. We aggregate these different and often opposing perspectives to form a systems view of the problem, and it does two things as well. First, it facilitates a shared understanding of the problem among stakeholder groups. And second, it enables us to identify what we call zones of opportunity or solutions or excuse me, systems interventions have the potential to solve for multiple issues simultaneously. But to do this, we need to understand the systems dynamic within the systems problem, especially the speed of change that can be expected within different sectors of socio-technical systems. We think of wicked problems as constellations of interconnected issues that always arise within these five archetypal sectors of society. Any solution we implement is always situated within one of these sectors, whether we realize it or not. But because each sector has its own anatomy and speed at which change can happen and is connected in complex ways to other sectors, these dynamics of change must be taken into consideration when we're designing solutions. We created this diagram to help explain the relationships between these societal sectors and how they affect the efficacy of solutions because of these systems dynamics. We need to develop solution ecologies around a keystone solution. Maybe it's policy or maybe it's a product. By ecology, I mean solutions that are situated in other sectors, but are connected in ways that scaffold and amplify each other. We think this suggests a new type of specialty, that of the systems ambassador, whose role is to broker connections between projects and initiatives to form a genuine solution cluster. For those who are interested, this diagram can be downloaded from my academia.edu page. This is a detail of the final problem map from the NASDAQ project. And as you can see, it was very large and it aggregated all stakeholder responses about the lack of funding for minority entrepreneurs. The solid boxes are what we call emergent themes. They're categories that are suggested by the data around which we cluster similar stakeholder responses. Here you see that all stakeholder groups cited a lack of access to social capital as a key issue connected to the problem. A second and unsurprising problem category was racism and otherness. Because responses are coded by stakeholder group and unedited, the map provides valuable insight into each group's perspective on the problem. But it also shows us where there is agreement on an issue across all stakeholder groups. <clears throat> I'm sorry, my thing is not loading. These are all of the emergent categories within the map which gives us an immediate overview of what all of the stakeholders were thinking. And by separating issues this way, it provides an early indication 
of the type of solution required in a particular sector. Each of the different colors represents a different sector. The map also enables us to identify feedback loops, a dynamic in which issues connect, feed into, and amplify each other. Here we see how attitudes, cultural norms, and systemic racism combine to affect discriminatory lending practices and metrics within venture capital funding, as well as affecting laws, regulation, and oversight. And here we see how the issue of a lack of an incorrect or skewed data exacerbates problems in practically every area of the venture capital and funding ecology. This is a good example of the surprises that emerge when we leverage the knowledge already within a system through stakeholder engagement. In this project, every stakeholder group told us that a lack of data and problematic data was making the problem worse. The results of our research led NASDAQ and JP Morgan to immediately launch an initiative called Data for Good to develop new, better metrics for funding, increased diligence, and accuracy in recording results around lending to minority entrepreneurs. And it began to eliminate the legacy of redlining practices here in the US. If, if you don't know what that is, I, you can find it on the internet. So after mapping the problem, step two takes a closer look at the complex stakeholder emotions and relations that sit underneath the problem, and this is what keeps it stuck. There are countless stakeholder groups that are connected to and affected by any wicked problem, and these include both human and non-human groups. Part of what makes these problems wicked is the conflicting agendas among stakeholder groups. Many times, one group's fondest hope is another worst fear. And these relations of conflict are often the unseen barriers to problem resolution. But within any wicked problem, we also find relations of affinity and agreement. They aren't always obvious, but they are the low hanging fruit in the system. They show us where we can begin working immediately, creating solutions that have broad stakeholder support. This will chalk up very quick wins and it will build bridges between stakeholder groups. Another key factor is understanding the uneven power relations among these groups and the way in which these imbalances undermine solutions. Every problem is different, but this diagram shows stakeholder archetypes that we see in almost every wicked problem. So you can actually plot these uh, along a continuum of power relations so that you can begin to see who has more or less power. Um, you can see that if you doing this will reveal which groups are most adversely affected by the problem, which groups are not affected. It shows you which groups don't care about the problem but it also shows you which group might be interested in helping to solve it. But the most important thing is to discover which groups are actually benefiting from the problem and how much power they have to resist solutions, because that is often the case. And finally, it reveals which groups are invisible because they have no voice or power or are simply indifferent to the problem. Mapping these relations shows us where and why the problem is stuck, and it helps explain why so many solutions are failing. It also reveals strategy for building coalitions between stakeholder groups that can disrupt entrenched power relations and open up opportunities for new and different kinds of interventions. Now, we've worked with stakeholders in both online and in-person workshops with up to 80 people in a multiple stakeholder group. And our analysis of the data clearly shows us where stakeholders are in agreement or conflict. And it, we can look for that low hanging fruit in the system. Here you see that this second step validated what stakeholders told us in step one, that there's an urgent need for better data and more equitable funding. And mapping a system 
This is the type of cross-referencing we're looking for that tells us that we've identified what we call a keystone issue. So let's move on to the next step. Once we've mapped the problem and its complex stakeholder relations, we then extend the problem frame into the distant past to understand how the problem evolved over the course of multiple decades to become wicked. The systems map that emerges shows historic roots of the problem, which always reveals insights from the past that should be informing solutions in the present. But as we know, this rarely happens because we just keep repeating the problems from the past. After mapping the problem's historic evolution, we next ask stakeholders to think deeply and creatively about the future by asking what they want to transition toward. Here, stakeholder groups co-create visions of long-term futures in which the problem has been resolved and everyday life has become more sustainable, equitable, and desirable. So when stakeholder groups glimpse a future in which they more or less agree, it helps them transcend their differences in the present and work together toward that common future. Stakeholder visions also become a database of ideas about the future that can inform tangible system solutioning in the present. We ask stakeholders to imagine the future within the context of everyday life at six different levels of scale, the household, the neighborhood, the city, region, nation, and planet. Their perspectives are brought together in a large future visions map that resembles the problem map in step one, where unedited stakeholder responses are clustered around emergent vision categories. These maps not only provide a vivid picture of the future at different levels of scale, but they also contain countless ideas for solutions that can be implemented in the present. Because each response is coded to a specific stakeholder group, we can easily see where many groups are in agreement. And we always see more agreement than differences within stakeholder future visions. Future visions from the NASDAQ project fell into three distinct categories. Vision is, visions is centered around improving the overall quality of life, visions related to entrepreneurship and funding equity, and visions that contain tangible solution ideas that can be used right now. Because time is short, I'm going to skip to the next step, which is about designing for the years long transition toward the desired future and skip to the last and most important step, designing entire ecologies of systems solutions to address the wicked problem. Now, this differs from traditional problem-solving approaches because these solution clusters are informed by both the present and the future. We developed a solutions matrix, which challenges people to develop genuine solution ecologies. So the vertical axis corresponds to those societal sectors from the problem map and the horizontal, and it challenges stakeholders to think specifically about where interventions should be situated. The categories in the horizontal axis correspond to those levels of everyday life that were used in the visioning exercise. This challenges stakeholders to think about the level of scale at which a solution would be most effective. And this is something we often don't do. We developed this teaching example, working with the wicked problem of COVID-19 in the US. The solution ecology is compri comprised of very diverse solution proposals in order to address as many key issues as possible. We began building the cluster with three solution categories solutions that address deforestation and the origin of zoonotic disease, solutions that increase self-sufficiency in households and neighborhoods during a pandemic, and solutions that address the economic vulnerability created by the pandemic. All of these solutions and many more are part of the larger wicked problem of COVID-19. Note that specific solutions have been situated in different sectors and different levels of scale, and that the concepts 
are different yet complementary. This is a skill that needs to be developed when designing systems interventions. So once we developed a foundation cluster, and here's something important, it can contain ideas for both new projects as well as existing projects and initiatives that need to be slightly tweaked. And then we added others to create a large solution cluster that populated all five sectors of society at six different levels of scale. Often a good approach is to begin with a solution concept that has broad stakeholder agreement or that is easy and doable right now, and you begin to build an ecology around that. So notice that in this matrix, the connection between projects has been explained in detail, and it is as important as the solutions themselves, how they are symbiotic with each other. Because only a solution cluster like this will have enough traction to destabilize a wicked problem and jumpstart the process and transition toward resolution. Okay, I'm out of time, but I want to leave you with two final thoughts. The first is this. The approach I've outlined here is not a linear one-off process. Addressing a wicked problem is not like running a sprint. It's like running a marathon or a relay race. It's an ongoing cycle of problem mapping, future visioning, and system solutioning. Then we're waiting to see how the system responds to our interventions and beginning the cycle again. The last thing I'll say is that we think the accepted way of establishing metrics for success doesn't work very well when it comes to wicked problems because it usually involves small groups of experts defining narrow parameters that are, that are imposed upon a system comprised of diverse stakeholders who will continue to have conflicting agendas, needs, and ideas of what success looks like. So we're working to add another step to the approach in which each stakeholder group defines what successful resolution of the problem would look like in the near term. Remember, they've already defined success in the long term through their visioning exercise. Okay, that's it. There's a lot more to say about the approach. So for those of you who are interested, you can find more information about transition design on the Transition Design Seminar website that has readings and other downloadable materials. And everything we've written is up on my academia.edu website. Thank you. Thank you very much, Terry. Pleasure. Th th thank you very much. Uh, I hope the internet here in China could work well, so I continue. In the, so I can continue in the conversation, and and well, let's open the conversation, uh, Lucas and Terry, and maybe my 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 first uh, provocation of question will be regards this uh, idea of uh, introducing the long term in the design uh, practice. Um, design has been widely accepted for its ability to solve problems, as you mentioned. Uh, and, and, and yeah, we usually uh, came up with uh, this kind of a silver bullet solution in order to tackle today's problems. And uh, maybe, it's, yeah, because of what you mentioned is uh, uh, we are living on the, on the regime of the profit growth imperative. I think that you mentioned that in your presentation. So, um, but transition design requires longer perspective from backcasting to foresight. So looking far in the past and trying to, to have a longer view in the future. So uh, yeah, my first questions will be how to, to include, how to promote these long-term design practices since the I would say that the general understanding of design in society is uh, more this idea of us trying to uh, be problem solving for very uh, quick solutions for today's problem. Uh, and and uh, many organizations ask us for, for, for this kind of, uh, uh, of, of, of problems of today's based um, uh, projects. So how to include and promote the long term. 
Yeah, I think that is that is certainly one of the biggest problems. And it's not a problem with uh, design. I think it's a problem with our society. We think collectively and organizationally in very, very short horizons of time. We think in the length of like fiscal quarters or fashion cycles. And it's all driven by the imperative for quick profit um, that is based upon continued growth. So until we change that mindset, it's going to be difficult, I think, to create effective solutions for people and planet within any discipline. So this mindset is a wicked problem itself. But I often say this, um, it's, it's, it's a phenomenon that people in groups think in these short horizons of time because I think individually, we do not. Individually, in our everyday lives, most of us are juggling between short time horizons and long time horizons. Anyone that has children is thinking many decades into the future about their child's future, how to save money for that future, how to invest, how to prepare them for college. We also have midterm deadlines and concerns that maybe we're planning for our own careers. So we have to always think about profit and savings, but everything we do in our everyday lives is not geared toward short-term profit or we would we would be destitute. So why can we not take that longer term thinking into our organizations, our communities and our societies? And the other thing I would say is when you're trying to resolve a wicked problem, the thread of continuity over the many years or many decades required to solve the problem cannot be in the hands of external experts like us. Part of our work needs to be to build the continuity within the groups, within the communities, where the problem exists. So I actually think communities or organizations need to have people whose role is to oversee long-term transitions so that it is more like a relay race. You know, it doesn't mean that as a designer, I'm going to work on one project for the rest of my life. But it does mean that I will see part of the solutioning process as involving a handoff to another group, another team, so that that continuity is continued. If, if our funding organizations and our organizations cannot figure out a way to stay with solutioning over many years, none of these complex problems are going to get solved. And yet I, th I think it's possible. First, we have to change our mindsets and then we will come up with new tools and processes for figuring out how to run the relay race. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we need to, to, to change our mindset, right? To, to, to have a, an important shift. Uh, Roman Snarik says that we are living in an age of the uh, tyranny of the now. Uh, what do you think, Lucas? Can you hear me? Yeah? Can yes. Me? Roberto? Okay. Yeah, the tyranny of the now is it's definitely uh, a situation. I mean, I'm here standing probably as a designer, and, and it is true that the more information you manage, the more uh, you can uh, contextualize the whole panorama of influences that, that has to do with, with what you're doing and what you're going to do. And it's um, this idea of, of the wicked problems in the end, it's something that it's, it's like a hyper object, right? It's this thing that is so big that you cannot point it out with one finger, you know, this, this term by Timothy Morton. And, and I, I think that it's, uh, it's also like, a, I mean, the silver bullet, when you were talking about the silver bullet, it brought me to, to the idea of the vampire. In the end, the silver bullet is the, is the solution for a vampire, for a vampire right? So it's, it's not only a one-off solution, but it's also something that kills something really bad. And then uh, it's not about killing it, but it's about working within it, because the, the wicked problem, it's, it, it just became a problem, but the, what is wicked is the situation. The thing is that the situation became wicked and a problem, but it's, it's wicked and it's complex, and it, it doesn't mean that it's complicated. It's complex because you can divide it in pieces. 
If it is complicated, you cannot even describe it. So this thing of the different uh, bodies of knowledge that uh, uh, universities uh, work in producing and very expert people, if, if they don't collaborate and if they don't look to the short term, the mid term and the long term, um, it's, it's always going to be biased and it's always going to be conditioned by, by, um, by, uh, by a bias, by, by, by the sheer fact of being your, yourself, having been born in a certain context or having studied in a certain environment. So that's the unavoidable part of it. So in the end, um, it can never be solved by one person neither by uh, one way of thinking, neither by one culture, neither by one industry, but it's more uh, how all these clusters can collaborate and in the, in the, in the most pure fact of co-elaborate, right? So elaborate it together in a cooperation, in a sense of sharing before and monitoring together until there is a final um, um, checkpoint because there is never an end, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, and, and I think that, Lucas, you are addressing a very in, interesting issue regards interdisciplinarity or multidisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity that has been long discussed in, in I will say that, in, a, in, in, in academia, but now we are living like a kind of a new encounter with the, between design and, and, and system thinking that somehow uh, the, the system uh, uh, systems school, let's say, is, is, is part of the backbone of this kind of practices, right, uh, Terry? So um, how um, this, uh, uh, we, we, we could create like a renovated uh, design approach to, uh, with bigger awareness of the uh, interconnectedness of the of the of the world. I mean, uh, this 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 has been part also of the, I will say, of the Western thinking, and also the positivism school of that we try to eliminate right the connections between things because we think that we can uh, focus on one problem, but in in reality, what we are living is is is, is the interconnection of many things that you have shown very clearly in your in your talk. And by doing that, we forget about externalities. Uh, in fact, somehow we call it that way, externalities that uh, uh, I think that, that are not externalities, right? It's, 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 it's a wrong way to mention it because are, are part and are connected to, through the whole system that we are, that we are analyzing. So, so yeah, how, how, how we call... Uh, uh, create create this renovated design approach where where systems are 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 part of uh, an integral part of the of the of our practices. Well, um, I think it's important to say that's a problem that we all have to figure out together. Um, but the way we've been thinking about it, particularly when we teach undergrad designers. Um, because we say transition design is a transdisciplinary approach for solving wicked problems. And we say that because no single discipline or group of people can solve a wicked problem. It's going to take radical collaboration between many uh, disciplines working in a co-design process with the stakeholders to resolve it. But within every discipline, we still have to educate our designers with uh, deep expertise in making things. But it's important to remember that our approach <clears throat> is about framing the problem and getting a systemic understanding of it. And once you've done that, we will still be making things. Different disciplines will still be using the same tools that they do right now. It's like, you, we might still design something like this. This is exactly the kind of thing we design in the School of Design. We would design this, but we would be designing it with an awareness that it was part of a bigger ecology. And the designer would understand and have thought about the positive and negative consequences of this design. And it would be connected to a long-term vision. So what we're asking our undergraduates to do is still develop the ability to design something like this 
but to also develop a bigger systems awareness of its long-term consequences and how this is not a one-off solution, but it's part of an ecology of an intervention. And some people will still work mostly at this level in making artifacts. I still do typography, it's my core skill, but I'm doing it within a much bigger context. So I think it involves educating people about systems I think once you begin to understand systems and recognize their dynamics, you can't any longer close the aperture down. It's a camera is a really good, um, it's a really good metaphor. When you close the aperture of a camera down, you see very little, but really sharply. And it's easier and the world goes away and we can take pleasure in the making. I get it. I've done it for 50 years, but I think at the point we're at in the world, every discipline needs to be teaching students about a systems awareness, and they need to understand principles like feedback loops so that they know that they need to carefully pick where the solution is situated for the biggest impact. I don't know if that answered your question, Roberto, so I may have drifted off point there. No, the, the camera is a great analogy. So I was about to ask Lucas, uh, uh, Lucas, in your in your practice, uh, how do you lead with this uh, ability of zoom in and zoom out regards the the object and the system? Well, we we have a situation in in my practice that it's um, I, I try to get as many advisors as possible. I try to call in the knowledge. So if you don't really know the answer, the the best solution is to know who to ask. And, and not only try to figure it out in a creative way, what is the most logical according to you or your group of colleagues or, or co-workers, because we are going to be unavoidably biased. So in several wars, we have had people calculating uh, numbers of impact of certain materials we have chosen. And not only the chosen materials, but also like if we're going to use concrete, um, which brands of concrete do we have access to and of which of these are closer to us and which of these have uh, um, uh, um, a politics about hydric uh, footprint and which of them have a politics about a social footprint in the neighborhood and so on and so on. So in the end, we asked this calculator person to make all these uh, uh, reports and then we chose the concrete back uh, out of those uh, data schemes. The thing is that it's never a straightforward solution. Some, some of them will be closer, but they don't have a hydric politic. And some of them will be a bit farther, but they have a very amazing social project. And some of them buy green energy. And some of them don't give you any data. So it's not that it, uh, it is, it's sometimes it's the less, the less worse, right? Like la menos peor, which is like a, a bad way of saying it in, in Spanish and I think also in English. So there is not a good solution when it comes uh, to the use of materials ever because in the end we are using materials and we are extracting them. And even in many of my work, uh, we do extract it from the, from the place where it happens. So if we refurbish an interior, we transform the material that we find in that interior into the next use of the space. And that's part of what we always challenge ourselves to do in the studio. But that doesn't mean that we are not having a carbon footprint. That doesn't mean that we are not uh, consuming food out of our houses so we have less choice, so we have to go to the restaurant or bar in front. So everything has, uh, it's part of a bigger system of, or many bigger systems, right? Um, but I do find, I'm also, I also do also work in universities. I work in, in Design Academy in Eindhoven, I work in Madrid in EA, and I work in uh, Universidad de Navarra. And I find that in the students, this, this lack maybe of consciousness of the bigger picture, the interrelatedness of different systems, the idea that not everything is, is, is just a beautification or something that needs to be sold for the market. So it is a confusion of who the stakeholder is. And, and it's, I think it's, it's part of the education responsibility uh, when you work in a program or lead a program in the case of Terry, and, uh, and I believe you also, Roberto, right? Uh, the idea of, of uh, discussing openly what are the limits of the profession. And there are, for design, it's a bridge profession. So it always bridges 
the industry with the market, the professional with the materiality, and so on and so on. So we give shape and concept to it, but that doesn't mean that the, the, the problem is properly conceived and properly described, right? Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. And um, well, I have like a hundred questions here, but uh, <laughs> I, will, I, I would like also to give uh, space for the audience to prepare their, uh, to, to, to have to, to some questions. So please prepare the questions. And I, if you allow me to do one uh, last question from my side, uh, and it will be regards the, the, the speed. Uh, we, we are, and, and I, think, I think it's connected with the idea of the moving target that you mentioned, Terry, that these tar are not fixed. And we are living um, a, a, um, an age of a, a very uh, rapid pace of change and uh, uh, our cultural capacity of assimilation as a society uh, is, is slower than the speed, for instance, of the technological change. So uh, I think the design is called to be the agent that helps us to make sense of this uh, rapid pace, um, since uh, its definition has been so long ago, this idea of humanizing technology. So how, how, how in, 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 in uh, the, the contemporary scene that we are living, which uh, were artificial intelligence, biotechnology, and many other uh, 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 very, very um, uh, fast technologies are getting into our lives. Uh, design can be this agent for, 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 for assimilation that helps so society to, 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 to deal with it and how transition design um, can help us to lead with the, the rapid changes that we are facing. Yeah, that's a good question. I think that, um, I think two things. I think first and foremost, <clears throat> and designers aren't always in a position to control this, but I think nonetheless, everything we design, we have to think more deeply about what the negative effects can be. So we, we get an assignment or we have an idea to design something and that's usually driven by a very good intention or excitement or a passion to solve a problem. So you're driven by completely good intentions. And we can become blind to anything except that intent. But we know from history, we know from the human condition that good intentions don't always result in good outcomes. And I think we don't think deeply enough about, okay, I think this is a really good idea. This is going to be great. Um, and we have to recognize that mostly something like this comes about because of a profit imperative. There's always, a, there's always an imagined good outcome. But we don't spend very much time thinking about what the really bad outcomes might be. So can... It's, it's a question of mindset, it's a question of ethics. So at the point of conception in our sketching process, can we also devote some time to thinking, okay, here's the best case scenario. What's the worst case scenario? You know, they certainly didn't ask that question when they split the atom. It was like, oh, look, we can split the atom. Isn't that great? So we never think about potentially bad solutions and I think that that's important but I also think once we begin to see technology shaping into a wicked problem transition design can be an approach for bringing many different disciplinary perspectives together to try and understand the system itself and begin to change the trajectory of that technological um, advancement, because I think we're going to have a better chance of probably trying to steer something in a different direction once it's been invented, then we are going to be able to dissuade somebody. Look, AI is a great example, right? AI is here. It's not going to be stopped. And right. Carnegie Mellon, for instance, is a place where half of the departments on campus are like, this is great. Let's see what we can do with this. 
And then there's a few other departments like us that are going, can't wait, wait, let's just think about all the things that might not go right about this. And how can we, what are the steps that we can begin to take to try and mitigate some of the negative things that we're already seeing? It's, it, it always comes back to mindset. It's not about designing new processes. It's about changing the way we think. And once we change our objectives and change our mindsets and our behaviors, it'll, it's going to be easy to design new tools and methodologies. But you can't reverse fit that most of the time. Uh, Lucas, would you like to add uh, something? Um, no, I, I think... Um, I mean, I, I think, like, at, in the end, most of the times the solution has always been there with us. I mean, the technology is going very fast, but we are perceiving it going very fast because it's exponential how it is the, the sources of technology... Uh, Evolution, right, and 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 it's it's increasingly uh, exponential. But but the the path of us understanding and 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 getting into that pace, it's um, is is not easy because of the super connection and also how everything is transmitted down uh, and around the networks as uh, let's say the telephone. But but in the end, many many times it's uh, the, the the problem is in how we relate to the to the problems themselves and, and maybe a certain kind of, of you know like even if you say a certain kind of spirituality in, in a certain sense which doesn't have to do with religion but maybe in a deeper sense of connecting with the, the, the planet or the forest or the society a certain sense of, of sensibility that maybe has been jeopardized by profit profit market market right and so I think we have the tools. In the end, the technology is an exp is a, it's, it's like an expression of our um, journey. And, and so if we talk about technology, we're talking about a symptom, but actually we have the tendency to create that technology. So we could also have the tendency to, to use it in the right way. And maybe it's a question of sensibility and asking the, the right voices and collaborating the solutions from the, as, as Terry was saying, just, just maybe listening to the stakeholders that doesn't have such a loud voice, but actually they do have uh, a profound connection to the problem itself. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and at the end, technology is an extension of ourselves, so it is, it's, it's also a reflection in that sense, right? That so, for instance, artificial technology are going to include the, the good and the bad of humanity, and it's going to have our bias, because it's a reflection of, a reflection of our today's society, right? Correct. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I think that uh, I will open the microphone for questions from, from the audience, and... Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, Somebody in the audience with a question, maybe, or a reflection? Dario? <laughs> Not really. Maybe we can, I, I think it's very important also the last question you were proposing, uh, Roberto the particularities of transition design in the Ibero-American world. Oh, yeah. Which, which I think it's, it, it relates a lot with what we were saying before, the idea of, of context and the idea of, uh, you know, when, in the end, what do we may, mean with Ibero-American world and how does it relate to a short-term, mid-term, long-term past and a short-term, long-term, mid-term future. Uh, I mean, there, is a, there, is, there are many things shared, specifically and especially language. But apart from that, all the contexts are different. And it's not the same talking about the um, desert of, um, of uh, lithium producing, if we want to see it from a certain way, or the desert of Akatama and uh, local uh, cultures living there. And it's not the same to talk about that and to talk about the Patagonia or to talk about the Amazon River. And so it's, it's, it's complex to actually uh, address it as an entity, except for the fact that it's easily communicated in between 
the actors, there's, the easy, easy, there's an easy communication in between the actors just because the language provides. But apart from that, it's, it's a huge different local, therefore a different global uh, possible approach, right? Uh, oh, uh, yeah, what I, yeah, what, what I will uh, add to this idea of uh, the different particularities of uh, uh, transition design is that uh, um, uh, this, this, uh, it, it requires this uh, uh, mindset of hyper-locality, yeah, of, of, of some, some in, in literature sometimes it's called placement, right? How, how to, to understand the, the, the contextual uh, cultural uh, society, cultural society of the of the place, and uh, and I think it's an interesting challenge since our discipline in general uh, of design have inherited this idea of of universi universality. You know, this idea of uh, we can have a, 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 a even aesthetics or methodologies or solution that can be applied globally. So, so I think that we require to, to shift from this idea of universal values that we inherit from the modern movement to, to, to a more contemporary mindset of uh, uh, pluriversal, pluriversal values, right? So, so this idea that there are many ways of, of living in a place. So design uh, and design approaches need to, to, to get into that place and understand the locality, the context, and uh, that is what I um, uh, uh, try to say when I say hyper-locality approaches. But Terry, you would like to mention something. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I mean, I think um, uh, our good friend Arturo Escobar, you know, talks about a world where many worlds are possible. And um, one of the co-originators of transition design, Gideon Kossoff, who is my husband, um, talks a lot about cosmopolitan localism as being a, a pattern for a new way of living, where communities are place-based and very strong in their diverse culture, but they are connected at a cosmopolitan level in the sharing of knowledge and technology. So it's a way um, the opposite of modernism taught us in the 20, mid 20th century that this one size fits all doesn't work. Um, a top down structure doesn't work. It's a networked structure. And we always say, I said this in the lecture that these wicked problems, you know, things like Social and political polarization, we are seeing this all over the planet right now. I actually think um, it's a bigger problem than climate change right now, because if we can't talk to each other and we can't coordinate action between each other, we can't address climate change. So that problem is global in scope, but it manifests in very place-based and culture-based ways. The way that it manifests here in the United States or here locally in Pittsburgh is going to be very different than the way it's manifesting in Beijing or it's manifesting in Monterrey or it's manifesting in Madrid. It's always hyper place based. So we have a doctoral degree in, in transition design and we have students from all over the world that are looking, uh, researching for systems level change. One of our students is looking at um, extractive mining in Sierra Leone, where he's from. Another uh, one is, um, he has a, a global coffee uh, industry. He helps coffee, independent coffee growers around the world. But the thing we say to them is your research may be place-based, but what you have to do or speculate about is extract principles that can be shared with people in other places so that the knowledge you discover through your research can be reinterpreted in other places. And it's this networking and sharing and reinterpretation of knowledge, not imposing what you learn about mining in Sierra Leone, but figuring out what the universal lessons are that could be reinterpreted say in Manitoba, Canada, where there's also mining extraction problems. So I think getting this new structure in our, in our heads, this idea of 
cosmopolitan localist communities and sharing knowledge is, is a really important mindset shift. If I may, Roberto, it's, um, I think it's that, that drives back also to the idea of the technologies mentioned before. Like in the end, the, the hyper-connectivity, it's, it's something that is a global technology that allows for these uh, mindsets to be shared and, and what is happening right now, right? Uh, in this conversation between us, but not only that, also like, I mean, I think there are like global infrastructures that are allowing for local changes and supporting the interaction and permeation in between fields and be in between specific iterations of the maybe the same spirit of idea. Like, um, like you see it in books, like, I don't know, like uh, Radical Indigenism, in like Low Tech by Julia Watson. It it's totally looks into that, or the idea of Atelier NL in, in Netherlands that works with this idea of dig, dig local, think global, right? So, I mean, the, I, I think the creative um, disciplines are permeating towards this transition design. Maybe, maybe it's, it's, it just needs to open up uh, more specific expert-based disciplines to the collaboration into creative processes and maybe also the idea of policy making has to look and promote this idea, this co-elaboration of, of uh, 30 years politics instead of four years politics constantly. I think, I think what you just said is so important. I mean, policy and funding is such an important sector. I'm actually giving a keynote to the Canadian government on Friday. Um, about systemic policy making and thinking in longer horizons of time. That's a huge leverage point for change. If funding organizations thought in longer horizons of time, if policymakers were designing clusters of policies that were scaffolded by um, solutions in other sectors, it would be far, I think, more effective. Yeah, yeah. I would say also that uh, uh, how to create policies for the long term, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because as, as, as somehow, and, and it goes into this idea of the particularities of the territory, is that uh, at least in Latin America, uh, 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 the, 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 the long term plans can be like affected because every time you, you, there is a change in government, that it, it comes up with a new, with a new uh, idea of which is the project for the region. So how to create uh, institutions and, 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 and policies that can uh, look for the long term and take care of these uh, transition design processes. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and to yeah. keep the, the, the pace for that, right? And I think that's also a mindset thing. You know, new leaders come in and it's like, oh, we have to, I have to make it mine. We have to signal something new. And I was talking to an architect friend the other day who his area of expertise is, is design, build, and retrofit. And he was talking about how important it is for new generations of architects to help retrofit buildings that exist instead of knocking everything down and starting all over again. And I think we designers have a fascination with the new. Oh, we want to design a new thing, you know, it's shiny. <laughs> and there's so much important work to be done in changing slowly and mindfully that which already exists. But how do we develop a mindset to get satisfaction out of that instead of thinking, oh, I don't want to work on this old thing. Um, we talk to our students a lot about that, how important that work is. Yes, the fascination for the new, great, great phrase, uh, uh, Terry. We have a bigger, big fascination for the new. And the is young. There already, and the young. And, and the young. <laughs> uh, do we have any comments from the audience already or, or, or uh, raise a hand? We cannot see you, but Lucas, maybe you can help us. Mm. I'm trying to force them, but they don't seem to. <laughs> <laughs> so I think maybe we can leave it here. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's almost a change for the next shift uh, in the program. And I think we had a, I mean, from my side, I have to say it was a very interesting conversation and I look forward to, to continue it someday in the close uh, mid future, not too long. <laughs> so, um, 
maybe Roberto, you want to uh, close up, or Terry, both of you? Thank you. I, I will just say thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lucas and Terry. I really enjoyed this conversation. And well, thank you very much to Roberta Barban, Dario Sante, Gloria Escribano, Crystal Cole, and the whole team there in, 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 at, at the BID and the Encuentro de Enseñanza y Diseño. Muchas gracias y saludos desde Beijing. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Gracias.